G'day, I'm Tay Jednak, but don't worry, it's not contagious. I help foot fixers take their skills to the next level so that you can shortcut your path to the leading edge of your profession. I've been training health practitioners now for uh, over 22 years, and I've been a health practitioner myself for in excess of 30 years. And it's been a great privilege, particularly meeting and working with colleagues all around the world. Now, I know I don't look old enough to have been around uh, since before this interweb thing was born. I mean, Botox has got its benefits, uh, but indeed I have. Now, while uh, probably you were still in nappies, I was learning how to make arch supports out of leather and acetone bandages. That was in my training. I was also thinking, hey, do I trade in my telex machine for this new fandangled fax machine? Ah, those were the days. Uh, look, if you're a physio, a chiro, an osteopath, uh, maybe a physical therapist, uh, maybe uh, a um, remedial therapist, um, even a podiatrist, you're in the right place. Thanks for joining me here live. You're on Triple T TV. That's Ted's Tips on Tuesdays. And today's topic, ah, it's a ripper. Ted's tips to doubling your client compliance. In other words, getting your clients to do what they're bloody well supposed to do. You leave today's show with at least six, at least six effective actions that you can do immediately to improve the rate of your client's compliance on your instructions. Now, this episode, in particular, there's going to be a real key of making sure you use a specific four-letter word. You know what it is? Not the one you want to say to them, but it's one that actually is a game-changing word. So stay tuned. I'll reveal all later in the show. We're going to chew the fat about this meaty topic and crack it out live. We're also going to touch on some tender points uh, that'll give you plenty of food for thought. Uh, there will also be a little bit of psychology as well as the tangible actions that you can actually take to get your clients to do the exercises that will support their progress. Today's show is for health practitioners who feel that their compliance rate with their clients' exercises could be better. Ah, great to see Manuel, hola, and Brent, Brent Bertalicio, buongiorno, allora. Okay, before we kick on, let's quickly recap uh, last week's uh, Triple T show. Last week we revealed the uh, three secrets of speeding up soft tissue recovery in uh, your clients. We went through the stretch, strengthen and stabilize phases of rehabilitation. You've got to do them in that order. And uh, that was on care of uh, Thomas Michard's uh, excellent uh, text, Foot Horthoses and Other Forms of Conservative Foot Care. Um, Thomas Michard, uh, renowned international expert, speaker, lecturer, uh, trainer and specialist in rehab medicine. Um, we also revealed our exercise plan. Uh, and this was uh, us utilizing those three phases, well, which will be on this side for you, of stretch, strengthen, and stabilize. And we did that specifically for plantar heel pain. I uh, also uh, received uh, a great question uh, about uh, uh, the equipment because um, we use things like uh, the dowel, uh, tennis ball, uh, and uh, golf balls. Uh, and uh, there were a number of uh, great questions. A great question particularly about the Dow. George, if you're there, uh, your answer is going to be coming up soon. Uh, and I'll talk about that shortly. I uh, also received a great question um, uh, that uh, I'm going to go through because the, some of the key questions that we got were in lining up for the competition that we've got. Uh, our winner is going to be announced soon. So if you missed last week's show, you can still find it on the Foot Mobilization Techniques uh, Facebook page. The freebie is still there available for you to grab. Tito, buongiorno. Good to have uh, the international community working well. Uh, hey, look, and thanks very much for all the comments, uh, likes and shares during last week's show. Uh, last week's competition, of course, was uh, for the title of the show, which is Ted's Tips on Tuesday. And Margaret Taylor from Scotland won the prize of a new iPad. Uh, I hope you're really enjoying that uh, brand new iPad. Uh, oh, I don't know if it's uh, arrived yet, but uh, should be on your doorstep anytime soon, Margaret. So, who's in the house? 
George, George K, Manuel, hola, I know we've already been speaking. Brad, uh, we've got to get you in, across the ditch in New Zealand. Teresa, who is the current all-time record holder for the most posts up in FNQ, um, far, far north Queensland. Uh, good, all right, George is definitely in the house. Okay, so please make sure you say hi in the comment section below and uh, let me know where you're from. Uh, last week we had people from uh, Australia, New Zealand, Scotland, England, uh, Singapore, Brazil, and so, hola to our Brazilian and Portuguese foot fixing family. Wherever you are in the world, thank you very much for joining me live today and from my office here in South Australia. And it's a glorious sunny winter's day. In fact, uh, if I just swing the camera around, this is the, the view up towards our front yard. Uh, look at that beautiful sunshine being perfectly blocked out by uh, my whiteboard there. That uh, um, <laughs> gets a lot of work done happening there. Uh, maybe not quite as sunny as uh, the Gold Coast where Matty Rimmer is. Uh, so welcome Matty, great to have you on uh, board too. All right, so for those of you who've just joined us, uh, I'm Ted Jednak and we're here to reach out to the global community of foot fixers so we can join forces to take this, your skills to the next level. I tell you, I wish I had this kind of multidisciplinary uh, forum when I was a clinician. Uh, it would have saved a lot of blood, sweat and tears. So let's shortcut your path to making uh, your lives and serving your clients as stress-free and as efficient as possible. Now, as we go along, make sure you ask any questions uh, that you like. Um, and Craig from Sunnybank, from sunny Queensland, welcome. Uh, as my students already know, look, there are no dumb questions. Chances are if you've got a question you're not sure about, there's someone else on uh, the show who is also interested in uh, getting um, a, a response or maybe having that question as well too. Uh, all right, so now, something you've all been waiting for, and that is, of course, one of the hashtags for our show is show us your tips. It is Ted's Tips on Tuesday, so hopefully I don't get a uh, wardrobe malfunction here. Here's today's tips. Whoa, it is. Treat your next problem as your dog would. Well, what does that mean? It means if you can't eat it, uh, walk away. Try that out. Okay, so uh, we also offered a prize uh, for this week's best question, which is a new car. And I've got it right here. Yes, still in the packet. Oh, I can tell you, I'm so tempted to take it out and um, <laughs> enjoy this uh, new set of wheels here. But it is a fabulous speed roadster, the Street Beast. Perfect speed is the model here. So, what is, who is the winner and what was the best question? Well, let me tell you, uh, we'll run through the top contenders. Uh, there were Mitch who asked, uh, patients with high pain tolerance, would it not be appropriate to start deep tissue work and break down fibrosis earlier than week three? I don't feel like the tennis ball would uh, do enough for some people. Get the golf ball or rolling pin out. And this is a great point, Mitch, uh, because the stretching phase of that three-phase path of uh, rehabilitation um, there are other exercises like uh, massaging trigger points and utilizing golf and down and rolling pins. Progressing your clients along to these options, it needs to be determined on a case by case basis. So I think you're right in that some people, if you just did the tennis ball, then um, that will probably be too slow. But if people can tolerate a greater intensity sooner, then by all means, I think you'd certainly accelerate that along. Uh, we've also got uh, Mark who um, made the comment that uh, uh, use gentle stretching exercise as a preliminary measure for at least two weeks on a daily basis before any orthotic management in conjunction with FMT. This is great. So if you're incorporating orthotic therapy, uh, often once you've done the cast or the impression uh, before the customised devices are ready to be dispensed, helping loosen up, uh, releasing some of the soft tissue restrictions uh, that uh, can form through the arch of the foot in particular helps make it easier for when you do introduce the intervention, the orthotic device, uh, to be more comfortable for your clients. Greater comfort means greater compliance. Um, all right, uh, Catherine we had, what if a child's foot and uh, it's a flat foot and they're still growing? Catherine, kids are a whole different ball game, both physiologically and also um, emotionally or psychologically. And what I mean by that is, if you've got young kids, with the exercise routine, cooperation and compliance, they become more significant issues that you've got to manage. 
Uh, Teresa from FNQ, boy, I feel like I'm just going to swear at you when I do that. Um, how long do we go with the stretches before incorporating the strengthening exercises? Really good point here. So in the stretching phase, it depends on what tissues you're stretching. If they're collagenous tissues, you, you will probably find that you'll continue stretching for two to four to six weeks. If they're muscular tissues, uh, then these tissues take around 10 to 12 days to get a good degree of uh, stretch and release happening before the actual strengthening takes place, or introducing the strengthening. Uh, now, we also have some honourable mentions. Uh, and this competition went to Sophie, Dean, Hazel, Joanne, Sean, Paul, Craig, there's your name again. Uh, Katie, Matty, yours is in there too. Uh, and Manuel, he liked my iPad, so uh, <laughs> thank you very much. All right, so now you're probably wondering, who won the new car? Well, the winner goes to the best question of the week, and that is George K. All yours. Uh, so, who, uh, what uh, George asked about was the diameter of the Dow. Uh, and now, oh, sorry for the Northern Hemispherians and uh, the Europeans, uh, oh, the Dal, this is what Dal is, you know it as shtick or stick. Um, okay, so uh, with the, the um, diameter, we used to use 22 millimeter diameter. I just got a bit sick and tired of the number of times that the clients would come back and throw them at me or hit me with them because it was just that bit too aggressive for them to tolerate. So we now use, when we transferred to 19 millimeter, that was uh, the perfect size that was tolerable, but still uh, good enough to get the desired effect. So yes, 19 millimeters, uh, that, that is um, the optimum uh, level or diameter of dye, the dowel that we start off with now. So George, you are the winner of a brand new car. I hope you've got your license. I didn't check whether you've got peas or anything like that. So this will be on the way to deliver um, you in the very near future. In fact, this afternoon we'll be heading to the post office. All right, wonderful. Okay, so now let's sink our teeth into today's topic. And if you've just joined us, uh, so, yes? Oh, I didn't see it, okay, cool. Oh, if you didn't see the car, uh, maybe it's because of the square image and didn't show up below. It definitely, I definitely showed it. And whoa, 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 off it goes. All right, today's topic. Uh, so if you've just joined us, uh, I'm Ted Jedinak, and we're chatting about how to dramatically improve your client's compliance rates. We're looking at doubling them when it comes to exercises. Okay, when it comes to doing exercises, do you find it a bit of a challenge to get people to do what they're told to do? I mean, we as health practitioners know just how important these exercises are when it comes to affecting the rate of improvement or recovery from injury, especially with those chronic MSK conditions. Uh, now, Esha, you've probably found that out uh, yourself, I'm sure. Andrew, welcome. Great to have you on board. All right. You know when uh, I've probably had decades of uh, experience with just how frustrating it's been when clients report they haven't done their exercises that you've prescribed. And you kind of got this guilty sheepish look. Um, it's kind of like, you know, back in the old day when uh, you used to confess to the teacher that, oh, the dog ate my homework. So anyway, there are those clients who you've also got that actually do do the exercises. Woohoo! But when you review those exercises in your clinic, you find they're doing them completely wrong. In fact, it's a wonder they haven't bloody hurt themselves somehow. You ever had that happen? I'm sure you have. So um, I can remember a client coming into me for a consult and uh, it was a week after I'd given her three exercises to do and then we were doing a follow-up a week later. And she showed me what she was doing. And I had to look at her and say, who showed you those exercises? And she looked at me and she said, you did. Thinking, how the heck, how did you get that from what I know I would have told uh, and taught her? It wasn't anything remotely close to what I'd done uh, or what I had said to her. So it reminds me of, um, you know, how I used to equate my professional value and worth which how, with how much information I gave to my clients. Or in this case, it was how many exercises I gave them. Like the more exercises you give, the more perceived value, right? Uh -uh. Wrong. If you only remember one thing from today, and that's this. The volume of information does not equate value. So wait, lock that in. 
I mean, how valuable is it if clients can't remember what to do or they can't do it correctly? There's no point giving a whole pile of stuff if they can't remember it and apply it correctly. So this made me seriously reevaluate how I communicated with clients and what instructions I gave them. You know, when I researched the situation, I discovered that all the evidence tells us up to 70% of your instructions are not being done correctly or they're not being done at all. And I thought, you know what, that's exactly right. That's what I'd been experiencing in my own clinic. So this Triple T show, it's dedicated to changing that statistic once and for all. I'm gonna give you simple, tried and tested strategies that have worked for over a decade in our clinics and in clinics all around the world. So it's not only our, from my personal experience, but it's also from my students around the world who've uh, also applied this. And hopefully, Dean, you're on board with that too. Okay, so also there's a really special freebie on offer for you today. It's a remarkable resource that's, it's my gift to you. Uh, I'll reveal how you can get to this free cheat sheet at the end of the show. Look, I uh, just want to clarify, if you've already got excellent compliance rates with your exercises, then the show, it's not for you. Or perhaps you don't even prescribe exercises. Maybe you try to provide uh, orthotic therapy or intervention and that's all that you need. Exercises are not uh, uh, significant. If that's the case, you may as well tune out. Uh, if you've got a problem saying, you know, like it's the client's fault that exercise don't get done, nah, hit delete. Um, maybe, you know, sometimes uh, practitioners uh, think that Clients just don't listen to their instructions, or the clients just don't get it. And if that's the case, oh, you go, I've got some pearls that are going to change your uh, perception of what actually goes on in clients' mind today. Um, see, some clients, the practitioners think that compliance has nothing to do with them. I wonder, is it my responsibility if clients don't comply? Well, you know, it's crucial to understand that clients, when they pay you money for your service, it's highly likely that one, they're in, literally invested in getting better as quickly as possible because of what they're there for. Two, they're going to pay very close attention for your advice, and that includes advice about exercises. Plus, three, it's highly likely that given clients are also motivated to get out of pain, that their compliance rates should actually be at an optimum. In other words, Far from being lazy or disinterested, paying clients who are in pain are actually ideally positioned to get cracking on your advice as soon as possible. Sometimes they can be overly enthusiastic. But any physio, uh, physical therapist, <laughs> specialist, oh, we got some real life world there. Hello, Penny. Penny. Oh, I want to go, Daddy. Okay, so just come to join in. Um, but, you know, physios, uh, rehab specialists, they'll tell you that it's a constant struggle with uh, compliance rates with uh, your clients. Yet we know that improving clients' compliant rates has a direct impact on the clinical outcomes that your clients achieve. Now, multiple systemic reviews confirm this. Those reviews also quote uh, non-compliance rates in the order of 50 to 70 percent. So, let's get on with improving that percentage because our clients, your clients, progress, it depends on them getting better compliance and actually doing what is going to be good for them. So what I'm saying is that a practitioner's role can be very effective in increasing compliance uh, rates of your clients. In my experience, what you do and say has a direct impact on your client's compliance rates. It's so important to recognize that practitioners' instructions and communications, what we say, what we do, play a massive role in exploding clients' compliance rates. So let's chat about communication and the essential factors that we need to consider to improve those compliance rates. It involves an important four-letter word and a crucial communication network and a com uh, sorry, com crucial communication framework. It's actually incredibly simple once you know how this works. But first of all, let me take you through step by step through an example of how I officially communicate an exercise to a client. Would that be useful? You want to see an example of how it actually works in the real world? Just type in yes. While you're doing that, let me lubricate the throat. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to use uh, Scully here, who's uh, joined in. Whoa, okay. 
Oh, it's good. Falling apart, falling pieces. Okay, so let's imagine I'm going to be teaching the tennis ball exercise to Scully. So, great. So, Scully, um, what we're going to do is begin the first exercise for you today. It's going to involve a simple tennis ball here, uh, and it's an exercise that will just help prepare some of the tissues, release some of the restrictions, so we can get you improving and repairing uh, this foot problem as quickly as possible. So, the way it's going to work is, so, uh, oh, look, I've got uh, all of the instructions here written down. Uh, so, they're all down here. You can take this home with you, but it's pretty simple. I'll just explain how it works. You're going to sit yourself down, and then you're going to literally roll your foot over the tennis ball, the length of the foot, for 15 seconds. Then you'll go in circles through the ball of the foot, the arch of the foot, the heel of the foot, for another 15 seconds. And then you'll do the same thing on the other foot. Uh, best time of day to do this is first thing in the morning, last thing at night. Uh, so if you have the ball by your bedside, it's a convenient way to in, uh, incorporate into your daily routine. Great. Any questions? Okay, good. So what I'll get you to do now is show me how you do this exercise. Great. Now, Scully obviously is going to be a little bit uh, camera shy here, but I would go to get the client to do the exercise, show me how they're doing it, make any corrections or adjustments as required. Terrific. Excellent. Okay, now, Scully, with uh, this exercise, um, what I'm also going to do is organize to send you a video link so that you can review it any time if you have any concerns about doing it correctly. Make sense? Great. And off uh, Scully goes. Um, they've got the instruction sheet, uh, and we're all set to roll forward. Now, let me simply debrief what I just did then with Scully about this tennis ball massage exercise. I'm going to run you through the key elements of instructing clients on their exercises so that you can clearly understand the crucial benchmarks to cover so that you can get even better compliance rates for your clients. Would that be useful for you? Great. Okay, so the first thing I did with Mary, or also known as Scully, was make the importance of this exercise very clear. And the way I did that was by using a four-letter word. Do you remember what it was? Type it in. If you know what that four-letter word was that I used, type it in. Yep, the four-letter word was need, N-E-E-D. -E I didn't say, I would like you to do this exercise, and I didn't say, I want you to do this exercise. I said, Scully, you need to do this exercise so that you can get the release of those tissues through the sole of the foot to help you get better as soon as possible. Remember when I said that? Okay. so. Let's just do a little experiment here, just so I can really nail this crucial point. Are you ready? Great. Let's consider for a moment that I told you that I wanted you to do an exercise. And just weigh that up. Great. So, George, I want you to do this exercise for your uh, treat part of your treatment. Now, are you kind of thinking, well, Okay, sure, yep, perhaps, okay, maybe I will, maybe I won't. So you're not fully convinced, are you? What if I told you I'd like you to do this exercise? Well, that's a very polite word there. So um, let's think about that. Uh, Dean, I'd like you to do this exercise and uh, to help with your progress. Okay, now you might be thinking, all right, nice, that's, you know, the, the word like is all very nice and all. Do I really have to do it? I mean, you know, it sounds like maybe I should, but is it that important? You see what I'm getting at? The words like and want are soft requests. They're polite, they're nice. And in response, you might see your clients you know, nod their heads and uh, you might uh, even um, feel a little bit like you're patting your clients on the heads and giving them a lollipop. But by being nice and polite, are you going to get your message across to your clients that it's crucial that they do the exercise? I'd say probably not. You know, being nice and polite to, to, to your clients, it's all well and good, but as a caring practitioner, you have to sometimes employ a bit of strategic tough love. Um, that's what's required in order to get the outcomes that you want for your clients. It's kind of like a 
being a sports coach. Um, uh, you know, if you're going to be a sports coach who wants to get the team over the line and uh, get the winning outcome, is being polite and nice going to be enough to get them across the line? I don't think so. I mean, coaches sometimes have to tell it like it is for the greater good of the team. Isn't that right, Tito? Coach of multiple teams there. In other words, you to really help your clients comply with their exercises, you've got to sometimes drop some of the nice niceties and get to the crux of the matter. Now listen to this. Scully, you need to do this exercise so you can get a release of those tough tissues to help prepare you and get the best results in the shortest period of time. How does that come across? Ding. You need to do this exercise in order to get your foot to recover as soon as possible. Notice the difference? Like it comes across with more urgency, more certainty, more weight, more clout, doesn't it? You see, when you use the word need, there's no room for negotiation. You get that it's important to do the exercise. In fact, it's crucial. Just by changing that one word, need, using that instead of want or like, there is going to be an amazing difference. Your clients will appreciate the clarity. Clients need to do the exercise, so use that word, need. They'll pay attention, and yes, they'll be motivated to comply. It's truly an amazing word to employ in your uh, communication. Uh, I mean, you can use it in a polite way, you don't need to be a drill sergeant. It's just a matter of, like, you need to do this exercise and you're very clear in your communication. But if this, is the, look, if this is the only thing, or the one thing that you remember from today's episode, I know it's already number two, but you know, if that's it, you'll be so far ahead of the field. But this is just one single step in the overall communication strategy, so hang in there. In this example of instructing Scully, I used a simple and highly effective communication framework. Did you spot what it was? It's a communication framework I use all the time, especially when I'm teaching and training health practitioners. It's a really valuable teaching technique. And believe me, as a health practitioner, you need to be really good teachers, communicators, coaches, even trainers for your clients. Crucial communication strategies are something that we're just not taught in university to employ. Uh, foot fixers all around the world have to contend with the person that's attached to the foot. There's no one attached there. There is someone attached to the foot, usually, uh, that you're working on. So you've got to work with them. In order to get the best outcomes for those clients, we need to have great communication strategies up our sleeves. So this is the communication framework that I use all of the time when communicating to clients, especially when it comes to teaching exercises. It's a simple framework and it's called the what, why, how framework. And let's little quickly chat about what uh, this uh, framework is about. The what, that is literally naming the thing, the concept, uh, the topic or the idea. The why is literally why this thing, the you know, topic, concept, or idea, is important. And how is literally the, how the, the thing, the concept, or the idea is done or completed. That often includes a, a process or uh, there are steps involved to get the desired outcome that you're working on. Now, let's explore how this framework worked in the case of Scully and uh, the tennis ball exercise. So what? I named the exercise. We're going to do a gentle massage, a tennis ball massage exercise. There's a the name. Why? What we need to do is we need to release the tissues that have tightened up in the sole of the foot to help prepare them for your further recovery and get things responding as quickly as possible. That's the benefits to the client. And how? Well, we gave the instructions three ways. I told them how to do the exercise, I demonstrated with the tennis ball rolling backwards and forwards 15 seconds, and then I got Scully to do the exercise as well. Now, then there were additional resources. There's the handout. Everything is written down here because your clients aren't going to remember everything that you've said to them, so have that as a resource. The other resource is the video link of the demonstration of the exercise too, because people always well, not always, often forget to uh, your, the instructions or the it always makes sense in the consulting room, but when they get home after 16 billion things have happened in between time, sometimes it can be a little uh, uh, unclear. 
Does that make sense? Great. So, using the simple framework of what, why, and how, the clients are then crystal clear about their exercises, and it doesn't take long. Like, it literally took me, with the demonstration role play with Scully, less than two minutes. Now, the best news is you can use this framework for explaining anything. For example, imagine you've got a, um, a client that you have done a biomechanical assessment and you're going to recommend orthotic therapy for them. So you literally you say, what? Uh, the what is, um, great, so uh, uh, Teresa, what we need to do, um, um, let me, we're going to provide uh, treatment using orthotic devices. Let me explain what that's about. So that's the what. The why. Uh, the reason why we're going to do this is uh, I found that your foot is doing some compensating and it's causing stress on those particular tissues, particularly inside uh, the heel and the arch area. And what the orthotic devices will do is help control that so your body can heal, repair and restore itself and recover as quickly as possible so that you can get back onto the netball court. That's the why. That's all the reasons, the benefits to the client. And the how? It's great. So what we need to do is, uh, and you outline steps involved. Uh, today we'll do a um, computer scan of your feet. That will get sent off to the lab. The lab will manufacture devices. You'll come back in two weeks' time. We will then dispense the devices. I'll go through a wearing in process. Uh, then I will do a, a follow-up uh, review with you, and that'll be about two weeks after that. So that's the how. That's all the steps that are involved with that. What, why, how? It, all covered. Everything the client needs to know is covered in that uh, um, brief you know, demonstration for you there. You see, using this simple framework, whenever you need to explain something to your clients, you'll have them feeling confident and motivated to follow your advice. You could be really innovative as to how you use this framework. I mean, you can use it to explain to a client uh, who you know, might have uh, shin splints, for example, you know, what the problem is. Um, Problem is you've got a traction or a stress injury to this muscle on the inside of the shin. The reason you've got it is you're training for this fun run but you haven't gone through steadily enough and it's put stress on these tissues and the mechanics of your feet are um, co overcompensating uh, leading to the stress and the damage that's occurred there and the pain and the symptoms you're feeling. How are we going to fix that? Well, we're going to, first of all, release some of these uh, tight knots that are formed here. Uh, we're going to do some gentle strapping of the foot to control the stress on that muscle. You're going to do some anti-inflammatory work with some ice packs and uh, therapy. Then we're going to introduce some stretching exercise. And you just map out the steps with them. Can you see how useful this framework is? Okay, if you have any comments or questions, please put them in the comment box below. I'd love to hear from you. And Tito, thank you very much for the acknowledgement there of the importance of this. Uh, we have spent many years refining, testing, and working out how do we communicate with our clients to get the best result in the shortest period of time. Uh, if you think this is useful, please type in a yes or send a, um, a like swiping across the screen. Uh, if it's beneficial, helpful for you, wonderful. I'm really thrilled about that. All right, for those of you who have just joined us, uh, let me um, recap what's happened. Uh, I'm Ted Jednak, but we can still be friends. Uh, today we're carrying on from last week's show where uh, we were, it was about speeding up the recovery of soft tissues using the physiological principles of stretch, strengthen and stabilise. Uh, in that show we outlined simple exercises that highlighted the protocol of stretch, strengthen and stabilise. So far in this show, we've reviewed the uh, evidence uh, that, uh, sorry, um, let me just recap what's going on, do a quick file search here. Alright, so far in this show we've uh, reviewed the evidence and outlined the frustrations <laughs> of not being able to remember things all the time. Uh, the frustrations of low compliance rates when it comes to clients doing their home exercises. And um, we've chewed the fat over the crucial four letter word that can literally change how your clients perceive your communication uh, around exercises. And it, no, it wasn't the four letter word that we often want to tell our clients. <laughs> Do you remember what that word was? You can type it in if you need to. All right, so I've gone through a uh, demonstration also um, where Scully, my mate uh, back here, we went through the tennis ball exercise. And you, were, you heard, word for word, how I efficiently and effectively instruct clients. When I communicate with clients, uh, I have quite a disciplined approach that I don't uh, fluff about. I don't use extraneous words. I'm not trying to be overly polite or nice. I'm wanting to be clear and careful with my instructions so that it's easy to follow what I'm saying and that they get the best therapeutic benefit from my advice. 
in my experience, more clients that understand what you're saying, like the more they understand what you're saying, the more likely they are to comply. So the overarching um, communication strategy that you need to keep in mind is the KISS principle. You're all familiar with that? I'm not going to put a kiss here. No. Kiss principle. Keep it simple. Uh, student. Yeah, that's a nice, polite uh, description. So, okay. So, look, this was certainly a huge learning for me. Uh, as you can probably tell, I like to talk. Uh, my wife, she says, I like the sound of my own voice. Uh, okay. Um, look, many years ago, I got a, um, I had a mentor and uh, I I thought this communication thing was uh, impacting uh, the level of service and the quality of results that I was getting with my clients, particularly in relation to exercises. So um, what I did, he said, look, uh, he was interstate, uh, record uh, what you're doing. Uh, and this is back in the 90s where I had a little cassette recorder. Uh, it uh, had you know, magnetic tapes in there. And, uh, and the way it worked was uh, standard cassette tape would be about 90 minutes. Uh, and uh, so you put it in, hit play record, and, and off I did uh, the consultation and give my instructions. And then the tape recorder stopped. Why does it stop? Because it got to the end of the tape. <laughs> that means I've been banging on for about 45 minutes here, uh, and uh, it's took a whole lot more you know, that I need to tell. Uh, anyway, so what happened when uh, I sent the tape and uh, my mentor then uh, gave me the um, advice, he said, you know, you start well, and there's pretty much only uh, one uh, piece of advice that I have for you. He said, yes, what's that? He said, shut the f*** up. <laughs> he said, can you believe how much you say? You basically end up talking people out of doing stuff and complicating things. Like, oh, no. So, um, yeah. Well, so this is a really important uh, process for me to learn how to cut out uh, the extraneous words and hone my instructions down to the essential elements. And this is something I recommend to my students. Recording yourself on a you know, smartphone let your client know that you're doing this for training purposes uh, and then listen back to yourself. Now, I know you're not going to like the sound of your own voice and you know, but it's such a fabulous exercise to do. It's so worth it. Get over yourself. Uh, sorry, a bit of tough love there. Um, but when you listen back to your recording, listen to the extraneous words. If you want to take this to the next level, write out a new way of teaching the exercises or just click and rewind, or geez, that's old technology. So just go back to the recording where I did the demonstration, copy what I did. I mean, be my guest. Yes, everything is copyrighted. What that means is, if you're going to copy it, copy it right. <laughs> All right. But it's worked brilliantly for me and my practitioners for over a decade now. Hey, oh, for those of you who have just joined us, welcome. We're, we're chatting about uh, doubling clients' compliance. And so far in the show, I've outlined uh, the uh, crucial communication framework of the what, why, and how framework that I use every time to clearly explain something to a client. I'm actually using this framework over and over again in this show. Did you notice that? Have you? Already, I just wonder. Have you thought of ways that you could use this communication framework, maybe with other people in your life, kids, your staff, maybe your uh, significant other. Write in comments below who you think this would be a useful um, person that you could use this communication strategy on. Who's someone you might have had to, a little bit of difficulty in getting your points across so that uh, the uh, person on the other end actually understands or appreciates what you're saying. If you've got something, you can put it down here. We might do some, um, oh, no, was it uh, Dr. Phil? Uh, no, 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 we're not, going to, we're not going down that path. Okay, so. All right, has it made sense what I've been talking about so far? Great, excellent, thank you, George. It's simple, clear, and to the point, and very effective. Remember, I'm Mr. Practical, so I want to make sure you can do stuff uh, once you're done here. All right, any questions, write them down. Remember, there are no dumb questions apart from the dumb questions, but they're good always. Uh, we'll make sure uh, that we uh, can extract some of the gold out of them, because there's always going to be some uh, important thoughts to consider and clarify. Okay, now I'm going to cover more tantalizing tips. This is going to be really to skyrocket your compliance rates. But there's a little bit of psychology involved here. Now, firstly, have you ever instructed your clients to do more than one exercise in a single consultation? If you've ever done that, please type in yes 
into the comments box below. Yes, I have, or, you know, sure, of course. Isn't it normal? All right, great. So, can you guess what my next tip is going to be? And that is, only prescribe one exercise at a time. You see, what your clients have gone through to get to your consultation, you know, they might have had to deal with a whole day of work and then they've got some stress there and they're trying to find a park and uh, then they get in and you know, maybe they're running a few minutes late and they've been a little bit uh, worked up and they've got all these things going on in their mind and then you're giving them instructions and you're you know, uh, data dumping on them thinking you are giving extra value because you're giving them so much. One exercise, making sure they master it, makes it easy to understand, it's easier to grasp and concept and it just doesn't overload their brains. Cool, huh? That's it. Next tip. I'm going to begin with a question. Do you clean your teeth every day? Do you shower every day? Do you have other simple habits that you do every day? Of course you do. Well, so do your clients. So my next tip to you is link your exercises to a daily habit because if it becomes part of an automatic habit it gets done so scully do you remember what i said to scully best time of day to do this exercise first thing in the morning last thing at night have the ball sitting by your bedside so that way you can just sit down in bed and get to work and it's an easy way to build it into your routine that's it look i know if we take um releasing the the tissues through the sole of the foot there are a range of different exercises that probably are more effective uh, in to have the desired effect of the soft tissue release. But if it means your client then has to um, set up separate time or they've got different equipment or uh, they've got to make a special point or effort to do the exercise, the chances of them doing it regularly on a consistent basis is um, greatly diminished. So we've got to accept that as practitioners, our clients have got busy lives. So it's up to us as practitioners to carefully consider how we can incorporate the exercises so that they get done so that your clients get the benefit uh, that they've come in to uh, get from you. And it is to get better, recover, and get back on with what's important in their life. Make sense? Great. Okay, so are you ready for another tip from Ted on Tuesday? Great, here it comes. Provide all of the equipment that's needed for their exercises. So. Tennis ball, as a, an example, uh, we literally um, go to shops like Cheapest Chips or the $2 shop or whatever your um, equivalent is. The tennis balls are basically, as Jess, one of our uh, assistants used to say, if it's good for tennis, it's not so good for your feet. You've got to get those hard, flat balls that um, typically are pretty useless for tennis, but they're great for that massaging exercise. Um, if you uh, need to use the dowel, and we go to our local hardware store and cut up all the pieces and have them here. If you're going to make your clients go out and get um, their uh, uh, equipment or exercise, no matter how high tech it is, it's another burden and obstacle that's going to get in the way of their uh, ability to do those exercises easily and conveniently. Maybe you've got um, exercises with TheraBand or specific equipment that's got a bit more uh, cost involved than just uh, a stick and a ball. Um, in those cases, your responsibility as practitioners have them available in your clinics to be able to sell to them. Again, if they've got to go and buy them from you know, a local pharmacy or that type of thing, you're just making it uh, harder. You can make it easier and you know, add to your bottom line as well. Okay, so. Physiologically, the crucial thing is, um, I'm going to make sure that you, you get the next tip, which is uh, related to accountability. Now, when you next see your client, what you've got to do is check for their competence with their previous exercise before instructing on their next exercise. If you've used the stretch, strength and stabilize protocol, uh, and you should be, what you have to do is make sure you do things in the right order because each following exercise is dependent on the one before having achieved the desired physiological outcome. 
So with the tennis ball, that's a gentle way of uh, releasing some of the connective tissue restrictions through the arch of the foot. Then you, if you come up with a golf ball or rolling pin or a dowel, um, you'll progress, the, particularly the dowel is going to be dependent on the soft tissue having done its releasing work. If they haven't been doing this correctly or sufficiently uh, to release those, to introduce the dowel, you're going to find the dowel is actually going to cause a lot of pain and suffering. Now, this might be great if um, you're treating your mother-in-law. However, if you're treating a client that you want to get the best physiological result in the most uh, manageable way possible, then you've got to make sure that they do the exercise and they have been doing it correctly. So, that makes sense. You can't go too fast, too quickly, if their body's not ready for it. Okay, so, any questions, type them in. Remember what I said at the beginning of the show? I promised you that you would have at least six action steps that you can take away from today's Triple T TV show that will all work to double your client's compliance rates with your exercises. If you just join me now, here are the keys tips uh, that we covered in today's episode of Ted's Tips on Tuesday, and they are, one, use the physiologically based exercise protocol that speeds up soft tissue recovery of stretch, strengthen, and stabilize in that order. Two, discard the words want or like with, oops, ah, oh jeez, sorry. <laughs> seemed like it was going to work in my uh, imagination. I was going to need you. Ha. Okay, so discard want and like with need. All right. Three, teach an exercise using three methods of description that I described with Scully. So I did it verbally, I did a handout, and I provided them with a video link. Give them all those resources. Four, instruct clients using the what, why, how communication framework. Five, got them all. Keep it simple, smarty. Six, give one, just one solitary exercise or instruction at a time. I know with that one you might be thinking, well, you know, I'm not gonna be singing for a while, maybe I've gotta pack things in. Just know that if you're gonna give a uh, a, a range of instructions and uh, uh, requests for them to do, each one is going to diminish your compliance rate. That's just psychologically and physically what's going to happen. Seven, provide all and any equipment, whether you give it to them. We give the dowel and the tennis ball, that's our gifts, uh, and we have uh, more um, uh, costly items available for purchase. So that's, make sure they're available. And the final one, number eight, was review your client's competence before you proceed to the next exercise. Good news is, we got a freebie with all of these notes uh, summarized on them. So, uh, Ted's tips for improving compliance exercise, exercise compliance, you're going to get it from the link in this post. What will happen if you're listening, watching live, and George, I know the hassles you had last week with uh, downloading the freebie, it's going to be on the link that's right above my head, just there. But it's not there yet while we're live. Once this is, uh, post is redone, that's when the link will be up there. So uh, hang in there, it'll be just a few minutes after we sign off. Um, in that freebie, we've got the, those uh, key points mapped out there. I've also included a link to our video with, that we give to our clients of the tennis ball exercise. Plus, you'll get a copy of the exercise handout. This way, and what you'll see here is literally how we use the what, why, how framework. So what is, oh jeez, this is all back to front. What is the, um, the name of the exercise, the tennis ball, plant tissue stretch, the why are you gonna do the exercise, so that's all listed out for them, and how you're going to do it. So all these steps of the instructions are here, and then uh, how often you're going to uh, recommend for them to do it. So like, that's it, put it into practice. Uh, so you get a copy of that, you can use that, model it uh, for your own purposes. All right, before we sign off, uh, if you have a question or a frustration with compliance rates that I haven't covered today, please put it in the comments box below. Um, maybe you have a suggestion you'd like to recommend. Please enter it in. The best contribution we receive 
for this week's show is going to win a spectacular prize, and that is 1,000. It is 1,000, isn't it? Yes, you win a grand, a grand prize. That's pretty impressive, huh? So, about uh, next week, oh, I've got a really special announcement for you. We'll be bringing five, five, five live shows. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. These shows will be happening at the same time every day, 12 noon Central Aussie time. It'll be a spectacularly comprehensive series that delves deeply into the best practice protocols for fixing those challenging conditions that I get asked about all the time. We'll be tackling feisty plantar heel pains, recalcitrant cuboid conditions, and what to do for those orthotic cases that get better but not best. Plus, we'll be revealing the secrets to becoming a ninja master MSK practitioner for the foot and leg. You won't want to miss it. This is the stuff I get asked about all the time by dedicated health practitioners who want to be even better clinical practitioners, getting better clinical outcomes. It's the stuff I wish I knew much earlier in my career. That would have saved me so much blood, sweat and tears. So join me next week to fast track your clinical outcomes by discovering tried and tested strategies that work not just in our clinics, but in clinics all over the world. It's gonna be a gangbuster, five live shows in five live days. And hopefully I'll be alive to be able to deliver them for you. We'd love to have you join us and chew the fat. Thanks very much for joining me today. Please let me know what you think of today's show. It's been a huge episode. I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. Have you found it useful? What are you going to do as a result of today's show to help get your compliance rates improved? If you haven't already liked this Facebook page, Foot Mobilization Techniques, please do so. Also, if uh, you know a colleague who would also like to get better compliance rates, then please share this post with them. And make sure you join me next week for the five live shows in five live days. God, it's a bumper sticker in the making, I think. It'll be a cracker of a week. We can chew the fat some more. Maybe it'll be you who wins the grand prize. Just like today's new car, I can guarantee you I'm not going to spare any expense. So before we uh, sign off, I want to say big, big, big thank you to my partner in crime, Dr. Lil. Who, uh, Lil? Yes, oh yes, we can see the hands <laughs> in the background, but does amazing work to make sure that uh, uh, this uh, is a productive, useful, helpful show for you. So please join me in um, sending big thank you vibes out there. Oh, you got hearts. Hearts to Lil. You can press heart. That'll be a good thing. That would be lovely. Um, look forward to uh, showing you my tips again next week. We all have them! <laughs> As my mate Matt says, if you want to stay ahead, catch up with Ted. Well, that's a bumper sticker, definitely there. All right, it's been a blast catching up with you today. I hope you had a cracking good time. Until next week, same bat time, same bat channel, but starting on Monday, we're going to take your skills to the next level and fix more feet like never before. Cheers. <laughs>